Following the phenomenal success of the original, countless imitators in the horror genre emerged, including this R-rated sequel which was released in June of 1977. Although the John Borman film doubled its budget, the $30 million take at the box office was only 7% of its predecessors. The 118-minute story is set four years after Linda Blair's demonic possession in the original, but unfortunately the teen is still dealing with lingering issues. Now older and not caked in layers of scary makeup, Blair is able to portray a more familiar teenage character, but her delivery ranges from weirdly enthusiastic or uncomfortably somber. Ellen Burns, who gave a brilliant performance in part one, wisely sat this picture out. But her presence is not only missed, it's also unaddressed. Instead, Blair is living in a Manhattan high-rise with a female guardian, played by Sharon Spencer. Their expensive-looking penthouse is covered in mirrored walls and is missing outdoor railings. Now, interior decorating might seem like a petty thing to complain about, but what made the imagery and themes of the first picture so effective was its Georgetown setting, a plain and relatable house most people can associate with fear. But a pigeon coop overlooking Fifth Avenue only a millionaire can afford? It hardly incites the same effect. When the action does return to that dark bedroom of the original exorcism, the result is too little too late. Anyone who hasn't checked out by then has the patience of a saint. I've been comparing this picture rather unfavorably to its predecessor, but if you caught my review of the original Exorcist, you might remember I didn't really care for that picture either. The entire premise of the sequel, though, is built on the supposition that Blair is somehow still possessed by the devil Pazuzu, which completely undermines the memorable conclusion of part one. As a result, this story is never interesting, with huge passages of time where nothing of substance happens at all. And then when it does, it remains unexplained. Progressing slower than a snail, the movie eventually morphs into a National Geographic special, when it takes a lengthy detour to show us the migratory patterns of grasshoppers. There's seriously like five solid minutes of this picture featuring close-ups of flying insects. It's an attempt to draw a parallel between demons and locusts, but the connection never really works, despite James Earl Jones' best efforts in a minor supporting role. There are moments of unintentional humor, though, like when newcomer Richard Burton attempts to extinguish a basement fire with a pair of crutches or the bizarre inclusion of a consciousness transfer device known as a synchronizer. Complete with obnoxious blinking lights, this mind meld tool is relied upon to advance some of the picture's most important plot points. Like when Burton shouts, your machine has proved scientifically that there's an ancient demon locked within her. How it works or qualifies as science, however, is never actually explained. What was it? A leopard. He jumped right at me. The boy is still alive. Yeah, you frightened Bazuzu. Do you remember anything? Was it in Africa? Why do you say that? Well, it was like something I saw with my class at the Natural History Museum. But you weren't supposed to remember anything. I know. True story, I watched the 90 second time lapse of Boston's massive snow melt the same day I saw this picture. Guess which was more interesting? The entire experience was insufferably boring and just plain stupid. Despite the universal disdain for the picture though, Hollywood didn't learn its lesson and would ultimately produce three more films in the franchise. The Exorcist II The Heretic is a colossal waste of time and an insult to its namesake. It's a piece of garbage.